Well, ladies and gentlemen, our Bible reading today, and we're kicking off our Advent series, uh, Christmas Basics, looking at Luke chapters 1 and 2. Uh, the Bible studies for this are online under the resources tab on our website. There's also uh, a preaching postcard there so you can look ahead. But the Bible reading for today is a short one, Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. You can follow along on the screen or in your Bibles at home. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. It also seemed good to me, since I've carefully investigated everything from the very first, to write to you in orderly sequence, most honourable Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a sermon outline there. And we're going to work our way through these four verses. Uh, you can ask any questions by using the comments box on the bottom of the page. And Neil and I, or Neil or I, will answer that as soon as we can. Well, I was bailed up outside Woolies the other day. Uh, a person I know was frustrated by the Christmas decorations on people's front lawns. Uh, this person pointed out that although not a regular church attender, they thought people had lost sight of the real reason for Christmas. Now, we can get distracted, can't we? It's a busy time of the year. There is so much to do. As we gather pace, distraction can settle in, even to the point of being a mindless robot where we just do stuff, say stuff, think stuff that's flowing along with everything else that's around us. And that's especially so at the end of such a big year. Well, all that distraction can then sometimes work like a deluge, an overwhelming stream of staff, of ideas, of music, distraction, advertising, planning, requests, and expectation, events, and diary dates. And this deluge can then drown us in so many different ways. It can drown our senses. It can drown our sensibilities. It can drown our ability to discern and to stay focused. Now, as we get distracted and as we are overwhelmed by this deluge, we can start to devalue what we are celebrating at this time of the year, can't we? The birth of Jesus can become one of many things that we consider at this time of the year, as well as awards nights and staff dinners, family time, presents, holidays, even birthdays that seem to slip in. Such things, good things, start to become equal in value and merit and effort, so much so that the incarnation of God is set alongside the latest academical sporting prize, the newest table decoration and runner, the menu plan, and making sure that those holidays happen. And at that point, at that point, we might even move, not from distraction to devaluing, but we might move from devaluing through to doubt. Are we really serious about remembering and celebrating the incarnation of God in the belly of a Jewish teenage girl, born in a stable, greeted by shepherds and wise men in the Middle East thousands of years ago? Is that really relevant at this moment when family and friends and gifts and goodwill and food and fun and ending a traumatic year seem so much more appropriate for this moment in time, this modern age? In the face of our own distraction, our drowning, our devaluing, and even our doubt, we need to return to the basics of Christmas and know their bedrock importance. And that's what we're going to be doing over Advent. Let me pray. Our Father, thank you that you speak into this world. You're you're not distant. Uh, You're not the same as everything else around us, but you are magnificent. Uh, You're massive. You're awesome in the way in which you have committed to a broken world in order to bring it back to you, to bring your image bearers back to you. Father, at a moment where we might be distracted, where we might be drowning under everything in front of us, where we might be devaluing the significance of the, the Christmas, we might even be doubting. Father, bring us back to the Christmas basics, the truth that your son was born and came to live, die, and rise for people like us. Amen. On that point two on the outline, we live in a country town. 
Uh, things happen in towns like this, don't they? Things happen, news is passed on. Uh, we hand the events that we hear around. We talk, we chat, and humans are just like that, aren't we? Something takes place, we share the news, we share the events. Now, sometimes the communication isn't that clear. Sometimes it's like an elaborate game of Chinese whispers where words are mixed up with attitudes, perceptions, and assumptions. So, for example, a hamstring damage water scheme becomes a hamstring snap stepping into a hole or, as someone said, a shoulder damage doing... Well, something's taken place. Look at verses 1 and 2 with me. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. Something has taken place. There are events that have occurred. This account starts off by placing itself as concerned about things that have happened in real time and space. And they're not hidden events. Did you see that there? They're events that have happened among us. In that sense, it doesn't sound like this is going to be any different from someone's Facebook timeline or a series of newspaper articles or the, 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 the social pages of the newspaper. And that is until you go a little further and you read the full description of those events. There are events that have been, did you notice, events that have been fulfilled among us. Fulfilled among us. Now that immediately puts these events in a much bigger context, doesn't it? These events are not random. These events are not mistakes. These events are not disconnected from the vast scheme of history. These events are not just interesting occurrences that are to be remembered for their novelty value, if you like. The, the meaning is clear. These events that are about to be described because they've taken place have a meaning. They're part of a bigger picture. They have a purpose, a design, and an intention at their heart. That's made a little clear as we dig into verse 2 there, just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. These events have happened in such a way that they've been seen and experienced. They've been eyewitnesses. They're historically verifiable. They have their roots in time, space, and geography. Now, that's a very important truth to hold on to when you're dealing with fulfillment. There can be an examination of these events. People can be talked to, records can be tracked down, eyewitnesses can be interviewed, right questioning can be presented and answers based in time and space can be delivered. There are such significance these events that many people thought it wise and profitable, important even, to compile a narrative about them. This account, as we'll soon see, is not unique in one sense. Many have undertaken to make sure that these very important events have been preserved. They're such significant events that they change people. Did you see that there? These events gave people a new identity. They're described as servants of the word. That's a very important description, isn't it, there in verse 2? There's something about these events that changes people. That creates a new way of looking at the world, at themselves, at who we are, at why we're here and what we are doing in life. A a, a change that takes them from what they have been to what they have become. There's something about these events that draws people into serving them. There's such significance, these events, that they were handed down. They were passed on. It's a technical term. An important description. Whenever this word is used in the Bible connected to the words about these events, it's describing the passing on of a body of knowledge, of of truth that's been carefully preserved and handed on, passed down. And they're drawing all those threads together out of verses 1 and 2. We can say this very clearly. There have been some events that have been witnessed, that have occurred in the open among people, that are part of a bigger picture, bringing bigger plans to a climax, and they've changed people. They've been preserved. They've been passed down. So these events aren't like the gossip of a small country town, are they? The gossip about hamstrings and headers and cricket scores. These events are of such significance that people have been 
changed. Long-held plans have been brought to their fulfillment, all in such a way that life has been altered. Well, what are the events that are being referred to? I mean, they are significant, but they're not mentioned anywhere in these opening four verses, are they? Well, this is not the only book by this author. In fact, this book has a second chapter, a second volume, written by the same person. We'll come to that in a moment. And these events are described at the start of that second book, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. I wrote the first narrative, Luke, what we're looking at today. I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up, after he'd given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Well, the book that we've got open in front of us today, Luke, written by the same author as Acts and received by the same recipient as Acts, is about all that Jesus began to do and teach. About all that Jesus began to do and teach. Everything we will read is focused on a man called Jesus, on the lifetime's words and meaning of that man. They've all been observed. They've all been preserved. They've all happened in the open. They've all been passed down. These things change people. They are a fulfillment. Now, we're going to touch on this later on over the next few weeks. But again, this much is clear. The events described in this book are real in time and space, real in times of historicity, real in terms of their impact, and they all refer to a real man called Jesus and they're part of a bigger picture. And the author goes on. I'm at point three on the outline. Look at verse three. It also seemed good to me since I have carefully investigated everything from the very first to write to you in orderly sequence, most honourable Theophilus. There's a me there, an I. There's an author. Who's the author? Well, we're never given his name. Not in the sense of, here, hands up, I'm the bloke who wrote this in any of these these two volumes. Now, that's fairly standard for the biographies of Jesus, but we are given two clues. First, the author is not one of the original eyewitnesses. He's distinct from them. Second, in the companion volume to this account, that book Acts that I just read from, from Acts 16, the author is part of many of the scenes. He is a traveling companion of a man called Paul. That merely narrows it down to nine possible candidates. Well, by the end of the second century, 200 AD, the accepted and universal opinion across the whole church was that a man called Luke had written this account of Jesus and the church that came from him. In fact, by 160 AD, this was accepted. Our earliest known written record of the books of the Old Test of the New Testament lists Luke as the author. Well, what do we know about Luke? Well, besides what we've just said, his name suggests that he's not a Jew. And we've got three other references to Luke in the New Testament to his name. Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Luke, the loved physician, and Demas greet you. Or you could go to Philemon, verse 3. Sorry, Philemon, right at the end, verse 24. Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. Or 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 11. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. So we we get a slightly more rounded view of this Luke. He's a physician, a doctor. He's deeply appreciated by Paul, loved by him, regarded as a co-worker, one of those servants that we heard in verse 2. In fact, as 2 Timothy is probably the last book Paul wrote before he died, Luke was his final companion, and he was with Paul in Rome when he wrote Philemon. From all of that, You've got to assume that Luke is an intelligent, capable, close-hand observer of the events that are the early church. He's a close friend of its earliest and greatest messenger or apostle, Paul. He's seen firsthand the amazing impact that the life and claims of Jesus has had on the whole Roman world. He's probably not a Jew, but he seems familiar with the Old Testament and his understanding of the promises and plans of God. Luke is our author. 
Well, what about Luke's method here? Look back there in Luke chapter 1, verse 3. It also seemed good to me since I've carefully investigated everything from the very first to write to you in orderly sequence, most honourable Theophilus. Well, Luke's method reflects his occupation, his nature, his relationships. It's meticulous. He's an investigator. It's cohesive and all-encompassing. He goes back to the sources. It's comprehensive from beginning to end, ordered, structured, purposeful, and we'll come to that in a moment. Put simply, it's good history from a man who was there whose occupation was to look and examine and investigate and decipher. And then there's the recipient. He's mentioned there at the end of verse 3, most honourable Theophilus. Well, who's he? Well, Theophilus is not mentioned anywhere in the New Testament, elsewhere. In fact, his name literally means God-lover. Well, it's the same kind of name as Armadaeus, God-lover, Mozart. That's led some to suggest that he's a fictional character, someone made up to represent Christians at any place, any time, anywhere. But I, I want to suggest, given what we know about Luke, who's very careful and very meticulous, I want to suggest that we're given a clue about Theophilus. Now, the clue lies there with how Luke addresses him, most honourable Theophilus. Well, Luke, as we'll find, is a careful and meticulous historian. He's very precise with his narrative. On only three other occasions in the New Testament, this word, most honourable, is used, and it's all by Luke and all in Acts, the companion volume. Acts 23, 26, Acts 24, verse 3, Acts 26, verse 25. Each time... The phrase is used to refer to a very high-ranking Roman official, the governor of Caesarea, Felix, twice, and then his successor, a man called Festus. The way Luke uses the term, and it's not used anywhere else, the precision we know with which Luke writes suggests that it's not a random title for Theophilus. It suggests that it might be reasonable, although not completely certain, to assume that Theophilus was a high-ranking Roman official, not a Jew, perhaps in the public service. Luke writes to Theophilus, a non-Jewish doctor who is the close companion of the Apostle Paul, writes to a high-ranking non-Jewish office holder in the Roman Empire. Why would he do that? That brings us to point four on the outline and verse four in Luke 1. So that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. Luke has a very clear purpose in his writing. He's compiled these accounts, these events connected to Jesus because he wants Theophilus to know the certainty, the completeness of the things about which he has been instructed. This is history with an agenda, with with a purpose. I mean, every historical account has an agenda, a purpose. Uh, The purpose here is to persuade Theophilus, to persuade him of the completeness, of the certainty of the truth that he's been taught about Jesus Christ. Uh, It's worth remembering the kind of situation that Theophilus would have been. In. He's working in the public service of the greatest empire of the world, where the focus of the empire was on the emperor, the son of God, literally. He's heard about Jesus. I think he's probably accepted the truth about Jesus, that truth that has been handed down. But the danger, the pressure, the, the expectation on such a man is immense. There's the danger of family exclusion, the danger of social isolation the danger of loss of employment and reputation in the town, the danger of his public reputation being damaged. Even at this stage, the danger of the possible loss of life. And when you think about it, Theophilus is a lot like us or any person who follows Jesus anywhere. In our time and place, we can face the same pressures, perhaps not to the point of death, the same pressures to hide, even doubt, devalue what we believe about Jesus, the pressure of our town where people know us, what we were like, what we are like, how we might stumble, what we might do, that kind of pressure can affect us. The pressure of work and employment where the vision statements and the workplace culture can pressure us or even the expectations of what we do at work and when we do our work. 
the social relationships or sporting commitments where certain views are unacceptable, where certain commitments can be frowned upon, even the cultural pressures of our town culture, of our state culture, of our national culture, the pressure of media and and, and social interaction, all of these pressures can affect us, can constrict us, can confront us, can cause us to doubt, even move us to devalue what we know about Jesus, what we say we believe. Luke wrote this account of the life and times and person of Jesus, historically verifiable and investigated, to persuade Theophilus, to persuade people like us, that we can know completely, with utter certainty, that what we've been taught about Jesus is true, right, and life-changing. Put simply, this is history with a purpose to assure. This is history to get the basics right. This is history to get the facts straight. This is history to make sure that we know the significance of this man, Jesus. Well, such words are important for us to grasp at this time. Well, any time, really. I'm at point five on the outline. Remember how I described the state we might be in at this time, the place many of us find ourselves, or we can be distracted, floating along, not focused, just getting there, or we can be deluged and drowned by all that's happening at this time of the year, this time of life, especially in a year like this, or we can move to devalue what we say we believe about Jesus, making those facts one amongst a number of commitments, not the defining commitment. And we can move very easy from all of these to doubt. Well, does it really matter? What if it isn't true, this stuff about Jesus? What, what if it isn't really worth the effort or the cost? Are there any better words to hear than the ones we've just heard? For the distracted, now is the time to sit down with the biography of Jesus and be reminded of how central he truly is. This is life-changing stuff. Luke wants us to remember, Theophilus to remember, how these basic, certain, historically verifiable facts will certainly change who you are. Now is the time to take a little moment each day and remember by reading, by listening to God's word, how important these events are. For those who are being deluged and drowned, now is the time to come up for air the air of the certainty of Jesus, to pause, to come up amidst all the debris and detritus of life, modern day life, and see again that Jesus is important. There is nothing so important as events that fulfill, as the man who we will find out is truly God, as the life-changing truth of Jesus. Now is the time not to focus on the urgent, the immediate, but the important. Jesus really is who he says he is, and he's certainly worth following. For those who might be devaluing the truth about Jesus, being one of a number of commitments, putting it up there against the latest academic achievement and table decoration and gift and family time, now's the time to sit and consider the magnitude of what we've just read. No other figure in history has such eyewitnesses, has such a big description connected to him as fulfilment. No other figure in history has had an impact that changes the very essence of people. Such a treasure trove of certainty wrapped around him, such an influence across so many different cultures and so many different times. To devalue Jesus and limit him to one of a number of commitments is to downplay significance. And can we do that and still say we follow him? And for those who are doubting the certainty of Jesus, this account has been written for you. It's time to sit down and deal with the investigated, carefully preserved facts the accounts of eyewitnesses, the transformative impact of events fulfilled among us. Most significantly, now is the time to sit down 
and remember the complete certainty of Jesus by reading the account of his life that Luke has compiled. Let me pray. Dear God, we give you thanks for what you have delivered to us through the pen of Luke. We give you thanks that at a time when we might be distracted, drowning, devaluing Jesus and doubting him, that these words will speak to us. Please apply them to us. In Jesus' name, amen.